Well, welcome everyone for, to another podcast with uh, myself, Tim Muirhead from uh, Arbidine Capital and Michael Berman, also known as Michael Bearman, the CEO of FXT Trading. How are you, Michael? I'm very good. It's the annual uh, Plan Eagle Christmas party, one not to be missed. So, uh, uh, yep. and so look, it's um, I just put it's the 8th of December and we've got a, um, a, a bunch of questions today. I'll just run through the questions so you can uh, work out if these interest you. We're going to be talking about, obviously, the markets in general. We've got a question on uh, Goldman Sachs is expecting recession. Um, our interest rates are finally starting to take their toll. We've got another question on China opening up and COVID policies and what's that impact going to be. Uh, we're going to be talking crypto again. We always talk crypto, but this time there's a question on yield farming and whether it is it dead or just pure Ponzi. And finally, we're going to talk about gold and precious metals, which uh, I think have been they're starting to to show some life and uh, definitely starting to talk their knee. You might there might be a little bit of noise in the background. I've just had my my kids are finally on school holidays and uh, they've just had some friends drop over. But uh, we'll yeah. we'll take it away, shall we, Michael, with a market? Yeah, let's go. Let's go for it. And yeah, excited to hear your views. If much has changed. Yeah. Okay. Well. So look. Um. I mean, we had a bit of a sort of. I guess it was a, a little bit of a quiet uh, November. I mean, markets tended to be going sideways, especially the NASDAQ. And uh, look, it wasn't until sort of the final, um, you know, meeting, which we just sort of final day, which we discussed last week, where, um, you know, Powell sort of uh, talked about basically softening uh, their stance on the interest rate hikes and markets have taken off and everything was looking pretty good for a while. And then all of a sudden we've sort of had uh, four or five nights of weakness and, you um, I guess you know how quickly things can change and roll over. Um, now, is this just a bit of a technical pullback? I mean, markets were up pretty strongly in November. Um, we'll have to sort of wait and see. So firstly, for the bulls, December is quite a positive month. I mean, you've heard about the Santa rally. Um, it does look like we are, are approaching terminal rates in the, in the interest rates around the world. So... Uh, US, they're probably going to be doing a 50 basis point rise in December, maybe 25 in January, and that might be it. Uh, we had the RBA out yesterday. They have just raised another 25 percent, but they could be done now. So um, certainly does look like there's a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel for, as far as interest rates hike goes, and certainly that's going to probably uh, be good for the market. But look, what we're worrying about, Michael, is that... Um, you know, these things certainly take time and we've had, um, you know, obviously rates have been going up and markets have been responding, you know, to the rate hikes. The second phase of the cycle is the earnings impact. So, uh, you know, with higher inflation, higher input costs and, um, you know, just the higher cost of capital, uh, how this affects earnings. And certainly in the US, the uh, analysts haven't really... Uh, well, we don't believe they're factored in fully next year, especially as the, it looks like uh, certainly the US and, and most definitely the, U, the uh, Europe goes into recession. So, And look, we had a data point pretty alarming really out of Sw uh, Sweden uh, this week. That was retail say sales uh, showing that it looks like they're um, facing like the worst recession in 30 years. So, And, and the key, um, I guess, insight in that is that Sweden tends to uh, lead the Eurozone by a few months. So certainly not painting a, a great picture for Europe. Uh, we know, you know, the uh, they could be in for a tough winter with uh, their, their, their shortage of energy, but uh, mm. certainly not so great. But look, um, we'll see how it goes. It's certainly been a tough year this year for, uh, I guess, a lot of folks. We've had, you know, crypto, it's down 75% for the highs. It's, it's been smashed. We've had, uh, you know, um, NASDAQ, I think it's down about 30%. The S&P is off about 18%. We've had housing coming off. Uh, we've mm -hmm. had, you know, it's, it's 
we've had gold not really performing. It's I mean yeah. it's down from the start of the year. It's, it's sort of it's been pretty tough. And of course, bonds have had their worst year in. I mean, uh, as long as I can remember, Michael and. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I don't have the data right in front of me, but uh, bonds have had a terrible year. So it's, it's been a pretty bleak uh, uh, year. I think investors will probably look to put this year behind them and uh, see what happens next year because I think it, uh, you know, there are a few, few green shoots out there. So Yeah, interesting. Interesting. Well, ma maybe I'll just take a, a look at the markets from my navigator and, and see if I can share any, anything of interest there. Um, you know, what I typically do is I focus on the month, but maybe just, I'll just make a few comments here. You know, it's, it's very easy when you look, let's say we're looking at year to date, you can, you can, I'll pick one that I think is quite an interesting subject. T take a look at Brent. It says Brent year to date minus 1.5%. And uh, the reason I raise this is because if you look at it as, as just one snapshot, like at one point in time, it it doesn't really tell you the full story. I mean, you can break it down monthly. You can see that Brent has had a shocking month. It's come down, um, which is obviously good for us that it's as consumers of uh, it's good that oil prices have come down. But I, I just want to reiterate the point that I always tend to to raise here, and um, it's interesting that maybe why the oh, there it is um, is that if you look through time, you get a whole different story. Brent was up, you know, pretty much sixty five percent at one point of time, and then has been trending low. So I always like to look at a price journey. It, if you're going to make an investment, don't just look at where the without a chart and say, oh, okay, it's it's minus 1% or whatever the case may be. What one needs to actually do deeper homework and look at the price journey. So, that, you know, I just wanted to share that from, from that point of view. When I do look at trending, um, if I look at what's trending, I see some strong sales on, on Brent. Um, I, I want to just highlight one thing here. You've got a strong sell. But if I look at the oscillator on Brent, it's also oversold. So if I take a look at, at this trending chart, when it's when it's red, yeah, it means it's a strong sell. If it's dark green, it's a strong buy. And this is the, this trend indicator has actually been a really good, well, let's say indi um, signal generator for for catching big moves. And you know, pretty much caught this whole move. Yeah, it's been, it's been. I can actually, if I if I take a look at where it went red. So it's basically it caught this move here. But the other indicator that's worth looking at is this one, which is the overbought, oversold stochastic indicator, and it's now telling us that it's oversold. So yeah, it's interesting um, just from a technical point of view if where we are with, with oil. Um, I'll just show one more chart. Yeah, we got the S&P 500. It's also got, only recently it gave a, a strong sell. So it'll be interesting to see if this if this indicator is is going to hold up here yeah, and if we continue down. I know we were expecting the Santa rally and the month started off very strong, but it has somewhat re reversed so interesting times for the month. Um, if, I, if I go with my trend indicator, which has been pretty a pretty good signal generator for the last year or two, I'm going to say that we're coming down from here. Yeah, indeed. I was going to say the um, just on oil. Um, I noticed crude. It was the third largest uh, day decline in the year, and um, even the uh, forward curves going into backward uh, backward. Uh, Backwardization. Yes, so yeah. I've obviously read that instead of saying it. And um, yeah. yes, um, and look, uh, it certainly does seem oversold in the short, short term. And what's interesting is that um, with crude, we've we've seen China 
I guess, starting to open up. People have been expecting this to be quite positive in commodities, which seems to be the case. Copper and certainly nickel and other industrial commodities are doing pretty well, but uh, oil just seems to be wanting to go for a slide, which is, I guess, baffling some traders. It certainly does point to, um, you know, a, a recession in uh, in the US and the Eurozone. So, um can, can I just ask you on oil, because uh, I know I think you follow this quite closely, is that I saw that just came out that the U.S. depleted their oil reserves by 35% this year or, or this month. I can't remember. It's, it's amongst the lowest it's ever been in terms of reserve. I'm trying to think, what does that mean? Because so prices have been coming down, um, and that's maybe because the U.S. has dipped into their supply, their reserve supply, and alleviated whatever shortages there were. But obviously, if it's a reserve and it's almost depleted, there's not much more you can do, especially if they, you know, they have a cold winter, I guess. And, and yeah, I don't know what you... Do you see anything interesting in, in that fact that they've... Depleted? Yeah, it, it, look, it certainly looked like it was it was getting political. I mean, um, Biden, he was suffering in the polls. Certainly, you know, um, gas prices are one of these things that, you know, in the US, you, every time you drive down the road, you're seeing the, the gas prices. Mm-hmm. They were certainly getting up into record territory. I think it was making a lot of people unhappy. So, mm-hmm. you know, it was a political decision. Let's drain the, the SPR. It's, it's meant to be there for uh, times of, I guess, uh, war and... Uh, when you really need it, and yeah. it's, it certainly seemed like a little bit of a, I guess, a dangerous play. Certainly with you know the recurrent Ukraine situation and the Tyler, China, Taiwan situation mm-hmm. certainly heating up. But mm-hmm. uh, I guess it does provide a, you know, that they'll they'll want to fill it eventually or fill it back up. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, I think Trump takes great pride in saying he was. Uh, the, the last president to get it absolutely to full to the brim. So whether they actually do fill it up again uh, remains yeah. to be seen, but uh, we'll see going forward. I guess we'll, um, while we're onto that, Michael, we'll get onto uh, some of the questions uh, which have just gone missing in all my screenshots. So just bear with me. Sorry, guys. No um, problem. I, I think one of the questions from, from memory was relating to the Goldman Sachs view on are we heading towards recession and maybe some comment on China with the COVID policies? Yes. All right. And um, okay. So firstly, um, are we heading into recession? So look, uh, it's always been said that, you know, interest rate hikes work with long and variable lags. That sort of even comes from the Fed themselves. So certainly, you know, they've been they've doing, been putting these 75 basis point hikes. This is really slamming on the brakes. So uh, it does remain to be seen sort of what effects these do have. Certainly signs of things are slowing. We're seeing, you know, manufacturing, like PPI is starting to come off. It definitely looks like we're going into a bit of a contraction. Uh, I mean, it does remain to be seen, but it it certainly, I think, um, you know, it's... there's some people, I guess, saying that we're going to get a soft landing. Some people saying hard landing. How it plays out. Look, um, I always say it's 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 hard enough predicting the ne- the next week, let alone the next six months. So we'll we'll wait and see how it plays or it plays out. But uh, certainly we've seen uh, signs of slowing. That like housing um, starts are coming off in the US. I mean, a lot of these leading uh, indicators are showing that things are slowing down. The, the, we've seen a lot of, you know, the tech firms laying off staff. I'm sure that's happening in other places. So, you know, uh, unemployment will be rising and, and, you know, the growth slows. So um, whether it goes negative for, uh, you know, the technical two months um, remains to be seen, but I certainly think, uh, you know, it's heading that way. But uh, I guess on the other side of the pond or just north of us with China opening up now, China's obviously been described as the you know the world's engine of growth. Having that um, in lockdown, you know, over the last sort of year, uh, people are, are out there working and consuming. When they get back out, and there's all this you know pent up demand uh, that might actually take up you know a bit of the slack in terms of you know demand for uh, commodities and things. And whether the world sort of muddles through this uh, remains to be seen. 
Uh, it's certainly, I mean, you're probably noticing I'm a little bit, uh, I guess, on the fence. And the reason is it is quite a challenging environment at the moment, Michael. And um, we have several research providers, all of them excellent. And uh, even they're, uh, you know, of two minds at the moment. So, um, so even the, you know, the, the experts are, are certainly um, uh, not, not clear on how this plays out. So, you know, one day at a time, <laughs> we, uh, you know, what is it? Prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And uh... well, uh, I might help with um, moving away from the fence on this one. I, I, I'm predicting actually quite a quite a steep recession for, and I'll give you a few factors that I think are, are worth mentioning. But let me quickly just share my screen because the, usually the best. Hey, Tim, can you see my screen? Just yes, I can. Okay, so th this is the the U.S. yield, the classic U.S. yield curve, the ten year over the two year, and I just want to share that it is. Um, my data goes back forty, just under forty years, and this is the the most inverted the curve has ever been. So we minus we negative minus point eight percent. It's almost, in fact, it's never where. I can't remember the exact probability. When the curve dips under zero, it's almost like a 95% predictor in terms of a recession coming. It's so it's so inverted that I think the chances that there won't be a, a, a recession are extremely, extremely low. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, I just saw it earlier today, is that one of my other... Perma Bear, I don't want to call him a Perma Bear, uh, Nuriel Rubini, who called the GFC, I see he, he sees the S&P 500 down a further 25% based on um, a steep, uh, well, a deep recession. And then what, what I wanted to comment on, David Solomon, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, was quite vocal in the media this past week. They do some big conferences with their high net worth investors. And, you know, he did quite a bit of media and he he said, I mean, he would never be as, I mean, he's got real weight on his shoulders, so he would never be as flippant as I am with with making these calls. But he said he, he suspects it's 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 highly likely that there'll be a recession next year, um, which which is interesting. I mean, what does recession mean? We know what it means. um in terms of doing it tough in the economy, but I think we as traders want to know what is it going to do for for the markets that we and and yeah, I, I just don't think the equity markets have fully baked into the cake the extent of this recession on earnings because at the end of the day, price the price of an index or of a share stock is based on its future earnings. So I think one has to to realize we've come off record margins. Profit margins have been very, very high. We've been in a low interest rate environment. I think I think inflation is here to stay for a lot longer than people are, are anticipating. It's uh, The more I speak to people on the street, the more people acknowledge that they're going backwards. So they know that they are, are getting poorer. And therefore, there is this expectation that I need a, you know, when my when I come for my salary increase, uh, you can't give me two percent. I know you want inflation to be at two percent, but the, the reality is, my basket's going up five to ten percent. So you know, you've got to give me a decent wage increase, otherwise I'm I'm really going backwards. So there's those pressures. So I think interest rates are going to stay. If they, they may well have, like you said, they might be peaking at the moment because the economy wouldn't necessarily handle much more increases. But but I think they're going to stay elevated for some time, and, and that's going to have an impact. So, um, yeah, I, I, I guess I've got a pretty bearish slant. Just one last thing I just remembered, that Goldman Sachs, and, and only a, a quality outfit like them could do such a thing, well, and, and let people take take note of it is that they put out a 2075 forecast and i mean that's 50 years plus where we stand right now and their their, their main 
thesis is that we will experience grow, economic growth of below 3% going forward. And so, I mean, if I was bearish beforehand, if you, you know, the, this is probably slit your wrists type of uh, bearish, is that that they foresee much more modest, because for, for those who aren't familiar, we've had over the last, let's say, decade plus, we've had 36 to higher maybe even a little bit more elevated, let's call it 3.6% year-on-year economic growth. So they're anticipating over the next 50 years that it's going to be below 3%. And one of the main drivers of that is the fact that we have an aging population. So the greenies will definitely be very happy with all, you know, the fact that there's less people causing damage to the earth and and drawing on its natural resources but but yeah it's going to leave a big burden on people the age there, there'll be fewer people working for an aging populate population anyway there's my bearish end of year message yeah uh, look i wouldn't put a lot of stock into 50 year forecasts i think uh, you know <laughs> lots, of things, to lots of things can change them by them and look look one of the big people People you like the way people generally, you know, forecast the future is look at what happened in the past and extrapolate, right? And one of the big issues is yes, the uh, demographics are, are changing. Yes, there's going to be fewer workers per old people. We understand that. Uh, yes, people are living longer and, you know, having less children. I understand that. But look, you know, we are entering the rate, age of robotics. Uh, you know, Tesla's working on their their bot. Now, let's say it takes them 10 years to get that working and everyone has their home robot and uh, and you can get your, you know, gardening and doing all sorts of things. And then you, you can buy two of them and five of them. And who says we can't, you know, expand, uh, get all your jobs done and expand that way. I mean, look, they just have no idea. That's why I, I, just... I actually agree with you there, Tim. And, and when I say, just to add to the, and shoot myself in the, well, it's not my report. It was Goldman Sachs. But you might be familiar with the Malthusian trap, Thomas Malthus, who who, who predicted, I think, four, three, four hundred years ago, in the 1700s, if I'm not mistaken. He basically said that we'll run out of resources because, you know, the world's growing at such a, we're going to run out of food. And he was clearly wrong. So human ingenuity is amazing. And we will always come up with solutions. I'm pretty sure of that. So, yes, but doesn't mean we won't go through deep cycles of good and bad. But, yeah, but I'm certainly not doomsday. And this is not the end of the world. No, no, very interesting. Anyway, um, let's get on to uh, crypto. And the question is, um, is yield farming dead or is it just pure Ponzi? Do you want to have the first crack at this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah if you don't mind. So sure. I've done... I, I, I've, as someone who's never done yield farming, um, I, I was always intrigued by it, uh, but I always was skeptical. And I, now I'm pretty sure that it was nothing more than a Ponzi scheme. So what for those who, who don't really know what yield farming is, is that people would go and buy some tokens, alt tokens, alt coins, um, and then they would go deposit them with a, a at some... Uh, I don't want to call it an institution. There were things like BlockFi and Compound and these these platforms, and they they would go take your your money and then invest it in in projects that were chasing yield. And where was this yield coming from? And you know they were offering some of these some of these projects were offering up to two hundred percent per annum yield. Um, you know. There's, there's no one who can produce well, I shouldn't you can produce it once off if you're lucky, but these were projects with hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe billions, in fact was billions. And and all they were doing is they were taking your funds and and the next person who was coming they were and lending it out at at whatever rate, but promising a lot more, and then basically praying that more and more people would come in so that they could they could pay. So anyway, um, what, what I've realized is that 
it was always there's, there's no such thing as a free lunch. If the if the risk free interest rate is one percent or or it was half, if you could get it from your bank in traditional finance, let's say one percent on your deposits, if somebody's offering you ten percent, you have to know that that is highly risky stuff. If it's offering twenty percent, it's even more risky. So uh, it, it's absolutely crazy. And one thing I learned with this whole FTX debacle is that these protocols or these platforms that were behind all this yield farming. Um, you could go and let's say have Serum or Solana tokens that were held in very few amongst very few hands, and you could go to one of these platforms and they would lend you 50% against that value. Um, 50%. Now that's unheard of in traditional finance. If I went with my Apple shares and to Goldman Sachs and said, will you lend me against this? They will look at what's the daily volume um, on, on Apple shares. And and then they might put a factor of five, put a penalty factor of five or something. And, you know, I would get a very, very, if I, if I came with $10 million of Apple shares, I'd be lucky. I'd be lucky if I walked away with $500,000, maybe a million dollars worth of, Okay, maybe more, one or two million dollars. But in 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 the crypto world, people were coming with, to use the term they use in the industry, shit coins, which were these alternatives to Bitcoin, and you would get fifty percent of your value. And what I'm told with F with FTX and Alameda, what these guys they were borrowing against their FTT shares. FTT was the token behind this FTX. And we're talking big numbers here. We're talking like four or five billion dollars. So they would go pledge that and then borrow, get like on against the four billion, they'd get two billion out. Now, who was, was there any real trading in these FTT tokens? I'm not so sure. It was Alameda versus FTX playing it backwards and forwards. It was the same hands. And yeah, it was always looking for 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 trouble. Um, I, and my only final comment, I just want to share once again with a chart because I think it's it's quite instructive. If I look at this chart of the um, the historical drawdowns, maybe make it a little bit bigger if, for you guys. Um, if you look in. In June 2011, there was a 99% drawdown in Bitcoin. It was on the back of Mount Gox, which was this big, it was the first big exchange. But I know, Tim, you often say, because we've had a 75% drawdown from the top. Um, you know, it's not uncommon. We had in August 2012, 41%, April 2016, um, December 2013, we had an 80% drawdown. Um, December 2017, we had an 84% drawdown. So my my basic summation of what I'm saying here today is that, yes, we've had a big drawdown, massive, and in terms of value, because we were of such highs, um, we've it's probably by far the biggest, 75%, but in dollar terms, it's it's massive. But I don't think it's the end of the line for, for Bitcoin. and But I do think... Oops. I do think people will stop will stop the this nonsense with the yield farming. I think anyone who's going to do it will know that they can lose all their money. That's all. I, I, you just got to be prepared to lose it all. That's a great answer, Michael. And now can I give you the counter? Yes. <laughs> so look, I look absolutely agree with what Michael's saying. Anytime there's a 20% of 10% interest rate, it sounds too good to be true, especially if it's in crypto, it probably is. I, the, the only one that I've actually looked into and I was thinking of doing was um, I held some Ethereum with my super fund yeah. and... You know, if you're planning to hold this stuff long term, um, you know, Ethereum lets you stake the network. They, yes. they, they move from a you know proof of work to a proof of stake yep. model, uh, and you know, it's to incentivize people to stake coins, and and they essentially validate the network. Part of that is they get a, they get a small payment, you know, Correct. as part of that. Yes. 
uh, which is, is a sort of equivalent to, to Bitcoin, um, the mining rewards. Um, now, I think the yeah. Ethereum rewards are currently around the 5% mark. doesn't sound ridiculous. Um, again, I haven't looked at it for a while, so I'm not going to say this is something that you should do or shouldn't do. But um, certainly there, there are certain ways you can do it and some have different risks. So, look, the first way is you can um, set up your own node yourself. You need 32 Bitcoins. You certainly need to be savvy with um, technology mm. and, you know, setting up computers and having all that done. I know Amazon Web Services are now offering packages, as are other companies. Second thing, you can go into pools with people. So that now you've got a, a pool and now you've got a sort of counterparty risk and i think the third way probably the most riskiest way is you can do it by staking your coins by leaving them on an exchange and let them do it and um mm, mm. as we've seen exchanges go bust and if they go bust well your coins tend to go down with them so um now i was certainly looking at doing it the um you know the, the first way doing it myself and um but look, the, the only reason I didn't want to do it was at the time, and that, that was probably nearly two years ago, or a year and a half now, Michael, um, mm. you, you were, had to lock your coins up until yeah. the actual um, date at Wednesday when they did the mm. Ethereum 2.0, and I didn't know how long that was going to be. And look, um, fortunately, I decided not to, and then the price started going down and I sold the coins and I'm out. And well, quite, yeah, yeah so. Yeah, I, I'm on the same page there. Just so you know, because I am a Cardano boy and I have mentioned it a number of times. They're also proof of stake. The, to operate a node is very, it, it's it's a lot easier in a, in a sense. And I also went down the route of putting some hardware together and playing and trying to set up and as not being a great back-end developer, uh, I actually put it to put it to the side and, and I, I stake. But I actually put a, I put a distinction between the two because I I own Cardano and there's no if you own Cardano coins, which is ADA, ADA, you don't get anything. You just own the coin. If you pledge or if you stake that coin, then you're actually doing something with it. You 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 are part of a process which is which is getting a reward for doing something. And yeah, and at least what they do, what they don't do is they don't promise the earth. So they're saying at the moment you're going to get. So in, in my Cardano world, I'm getting three and a half percent at the moment yield, and and it might you know if I guess if the technology improves and transactions become even cheaper and cheaper, my three percent might go down to one percent or half a percent, and that's just the way it's going to be. So it's not a it's not a, a, a get rich quick scheme. You are doing a value stake in, and and I accept that, and I'm on the same page. So yeah, um, you don't get that with 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 Bitcoin as a holder, but yes, as a miner, you once again you're doing hard work. By the way, did you see in the paper today those Australian boys who who, who listed on the Nasdaq their mining house? Um, did you see that one there? No, they I haven't seen that. Yeah, they're, they're, their stocks down 95. percent So these were Australian guys that listed their Bitcoin mining operation they got all the big guys the wilson asset management regal all the big institutions in australia caught you know th this was when there was bitcoin fever two years ago and invested with these guys these guys were ex, were ex macquarie bankers and they managed to negotiate in in canada like where it is super cold they set up all their data centers and were able to get very cheap uh, electricity there. And don't and, pay your heating. Yeah, that's they would have been getting hydro in Canada and yes. not paying for the heating of, oh, sorry, the cooling of their service. So, Correct. Uh, very, but anyway, 95%, they, but they say they got uh, drawdown on their share price, but they say they got $47 million of cash and they can hold out. Anyway, right. just something by the bar. All right. Now, anyway, look, we, we're going a bit over time, so I'm going to move on to the next question. That comes on to uh, gold. Uh, is it a good or bad time to go in gold? I'll let you take this one. I don't All right. Um, look, and um, so this is actually something that, um, look, I've been following gold for a while. And, look, I'm, this is actually one sector I'm starting to get quite bullish on. And, look, and the reason being is, um, you know, gold and precious metals, they've obviously performed very poorly over last year in the face of, 
like sharp interest rate rises and a strengthening US dollar, which yeah, everyone understands. But they were meant to be this inflation hedge and we had inflation and gold didn't work. Um, but um, I think this we are now coming into an environment which could be very good for gold. Um, we're saying that the you know, rates seem to be topping out. Um, you were talking about inflation remaining higher than what they want. So we'll be in an environment of negative real rates still. That's going to be good for gold. Um, I think there's going to be ongoing economic deterioration, as you said. Maybe we get a recession. You're probably right. And if we do get a recession, the Fed are going to be faced with, with the, uh, like, letting, you know, the system collapse or do they go back and start you know, easing and printing more money and, if that happens, that's the situ That's the like when gold starts going to the moon. I think so. I think it's a really uh, good hedge for a portfolio right now. I think it's um, it should do well. Um, and look, it's it's been a while since I've been able to say I'm I'm starting to get bullish on gold, but I certainly am now. And I um, I think uh, you know even on the chart now it's starting to look quite good. So. Yeah. That's it from I, me. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree with you more. And um, I, I think I think the central banks have proved that they can be irresponsible around money. Uh, and, yeah, I, 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 one thing we didn't, one of the questions people had asked us about was this COVID. I know we over time, but just, just to COVID in, the, in, in China, I just think it's actually too important not to mention it, is that, they, they're making the mistakes that everyone else has already made and will continue to make. So first thing is the fact that they've done such a quick about turn uh, tells me that the economy is in trouble. So they need to open up. And you, you, I, I've just got it in my personal family and, and social group. I can't get over how many people have come down with COVID lately in Australia. There's like a little bit of a, a wave happening here. And it's incredibly disruptive, like dinner parties are cancelled and, and so on and so forth. And if you take it to the workplace, it's it's highly disruptive. China is got to still go through their, their, their big waves. Like it's going to be in the media. We're going to be hearing about hospitals overloaded, uh, ICUs. It, there'll be the fear factor. People will be dying, which is going to frighten people. People won't want to go to work and, and and be amongst others who have got it. So, you know, and, and China's huge. It's it's 1.7 or 1.3 billion people. Um, I, 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 think, I think the China story with COVID is going to be pretty disruptive. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, I guess we'll uh, we might leave it there. That was a uh, you know great uh, discussion, Michael. Appreciate your time always. Um, well, I've got to get, I've got to stop being so bearish. I know one will. That's it. They wouldn't call you Mike, Dr. Berman, uh, Dr. Yeah. Bearman for nothing. Yeah. That's right. So exactly. uh, anyway, guys, we'll leave it there. So you've had Michael Berman from the, the CEO of FX Trading and myself, Tim Muirhead from Arvidine, and uh, yeah. I'm, we will see, see you all. next week. And, uh, yeah, certainly if you've got questions, put them in the, in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you and uh, we'll leave it there. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.